So the film our group chose was Little Vera, produced by Gorky Film Studios. Uh, the movie was exceptionally popular when released, holding number one spot in the box office in 1988. It was also the most popular Soviet movie in the U.S. since Moscow Does Not Believe in Tears. Uh, the actress who played Vera, Natalia Nagoda, won Best Actress at the Nika Awards in 1989. The movie had six total awards. The movie follows a young girl named Vera who is living at home with her parents after high school. Her parents are nagging her for her college acceptance letter, but she keeps blowing them off, saying it hasn't come yet. She spends her days hanging out with friends, listening to American rock music at parties, and at one of these parties, she meets a boy named Sergei, with whom she quickly becomes infatuated with. Sergei then moves in with Vera and her family, but um, he doesn't get along with her parents. And so the tension between Sergei and her family eventually peaks when uh, Vera's father, while drunk, stabs Sergei and sends him to the hospital. Vera is interviewed by the police about the incident and tries to remain neutral as best she can. And she doesn't want to send her father to jail, but also doesn't want to throw Sergei under the bus. Uh, Vera then visits Sergei in the hospital, but uh, Sergei tells her to go home. Uh, she's prescribed antidepressants by Victor, her brother who's a doctor, but ends up abusing them, and so Victor takes the pills away. Uh, Sergei returns to live with Vera and her family at their house, where uh, Sergei and Victor both find her lying on the floor, overdosed on antidepressants. The final scene ends with Vera's father uh, sitting at a kitchen table and he falls out of his chair and he calls out for help but no one hears him. The story in Little Vera can be seen as an allegory for the uncertainty and frustrations of the people during the decline of the Soviet Union. The movie begins with Vera's family. Her father spends his time drinking, yelling, and taking advantage of Vera and her mother. All the while, he harasses Vera about her future, constantly demanding information about her friends and daily activities, as well as inquiring about her future education. His insistence upon knowing every detail of her life can be compared to the surveillance often used on citizens by the communist government in Soviet times. In relation, Vera has very little information to give him. She doesn't know what she's going to study, and throughout the film she sees friends and colleagues come to terms with their future. Early on, Andre goes off to serve in the Navy, and later on, Lena works in a nursery and plans for a future with her much older lover. Neither of these situations are portrayed as particularly positive or hopeful. Andre goes on to become a very negative character when he tries to force himself on Vera, and Lena seems hopeless for her own future. Throughout the narrative, what the future holds for Vera seems somewhat nebulous and uncertain. This can relate to the sentiment likely common in the Soviet Union during the decline of the communist regime. The most important characters in the film, however, are Sergei and Vera's family, in particular her father. Vera's father represents the Soviet legacy, and arguably Stalin's legacy in particular. From the beginning of the movie, Vera's father presents as a mean alcoholic and a manipulative figure. Although he's clearly portrayed as a negative character throughout, he becomes progressively worse throughout the film. Starting as a deadbeat, he eventually progresses to violence towards the only person who gives Vera hope, and he eventually drinks himself to death in the end. Meanwhile, Vera displays unwavering devotion to him, even lying to the police after he stabs her fiancé. This could be because he provides for her materially, which could be likened to the successes of the Soviet government, such as the victory of the Second World War, which remains a great source of pride in Russia even today. It could also come from the respect for her memories, which relates to the sense of nostalgia or romanticism of the past, often felt specifically towards the Stalin era. Her devotion is clearly portrayed as negative, as it results in her fiancé asking her to leave him alone and a near overdose. Nevertheless, her father remains an integral part of her narrative from start to finish, which can be seen as representative of the uncertain place of Soviet legacy 
particularly Stalinism, in Russian history. The four major themes that I noticed in the film were the coming of age of the characters, especially in Vera. Um, there's also a disconnection between uh, the parents and the children, which was also um, not only visible in this movie, but in uh, other movies like Intergirl as well. Um, additionally, there was also a, um, it seemed like a struggle to find an identity in the later USSR with the more um, transparent policies where there was a greater influx of Western influence with the music, the clothes. Um, additionally, there was also the um, contradiction between the parents' traditionalist views and the younger generation's more contemporary views, especially in the context of Vera with her parents' view on her marriage to Sergei. Whereas um, her and Sergei found no issue with living together, her parents found it slightly scandalous. Uh, the younger generations are culturally and socially separate from the older Soviet generations, as is evident in the movie Little Vera. This is mainly demonstrated in the relationship between Vera and her parents, as well as Sergei's interactions with them. This parallels with similar themes in Intergirl, with the youth and older generations disconnections in the later Soviet Union. This is demonstrated in the view of Vera and Sergei's relationship by Vera's parents. They're disapproving of it and find it scandalous, but Vera and Sergei see nothing wrong with it. What is noticeable in the later Perestroika and Glasnost era films we have watched is the increasing aimlessness of the youth of later Soviet Russia. In Vera, the characters are rebellious and seem to have a sense of purposelessness and have a coming-of-age experience at some point in the movie. Unfortunately, it usually comes in the form of a, the tragic death of a close family member. This could be considered an allegory for the sort of struggles the Soviets had with the collapse of the Soviet Union with finding an identity, as was demonstrated in the most recent movie we watched, Vanished Empire. Additionally, some of those in the younger generations also have a desire to leave Russia to go to the West where they believe that they can make a better life for themselves. We can uh, draw this parallel um, with Tanya, an integral, as she leaves her mother alone in Russia because she believes that she'll be able to make a better life with her new husband, uh, Edward, in Sweden, which, who she doesn't necessarily love Edward, but she marries him out of financial convenience. The themes that we observed in this film are fairly consistent with the other movies from the Perestroika and Glasnost era films. We continuously see the disconnection between the older Soviet parents who would have been alive during Stalin's rule and their children who were coming of age in a completely different era. While this is not an uncommon theme in any culture, parents having difficulty understanding where their children are coming from, it is unique in the Soviet context. In Vera, the younger generation's love of Western rock and roll, Western clothes, more contemporary views on relationships, shows an immediate contrast to the more conservative and traditionalist ways of their elders. However, the majority of these adolescents and young adults are dealing with issues that are well beyond their years. For example, we can use the example of Vera, Vera's father's alcoholism and Tanya, an inner girl, having to be a prostitute to provide for her mother, which... Um, subsequently causes her mother to commit suicide from the shame of finding out her daughter is a prostitute. So while they do have their own issues as young individuals coming of age in a political climate that is unstable to say the least, they do maintain a certain sense of composure and maturity. The acting was a strong feature in this film. As mentioned earlier, the actress that plays Vera in this movie won Best Actress of the Year in 1989 and overall all the actors I think took on their roles very well uh, all the reactions and emotions were realistic and convincing the dynamic between her and her parents um, at home uh, was especially convincing for me because uh, it reminded me of uh, my parents arguing with my sister and so I know that's how that dynamic happens naturally. 
Directed by Vasily Pichel and written by his wife, Maria Kemlik, this film feels almost documentary in style. It follows the characters from the outside. You are not part of this story, simply shown an insight into one particular family. This is similar to Integral, filmed a year later. The directors of both films chose not to elicit a specific emotional response. This is not montage. It is showing time as it is. Actor blocking is normal, motivated by everyday needs rather than developing a plot. The notion of normal is established by multiple dinners that are shown throughout the movie. The camera movement emphasizes the documentary feeling. The camera moves with the actors, motivated by their blocking. There is no cinematic, long, gliding shots. The camera is either locked off wide or on a shoulder rig that can move with the actors. Not steady, but realistically. Finally, the shot selection completes the documentary look. The director opens and closes the film with a cityscape, seen from afar. We are at a distance from the people. The way he chooses to shoot the characters is also at a distance, with very few close-ups throughout the movie. Any close shots are of objects or of the actor's hands. All headshots are from the chest up. Body language is much more important than the eyes. Vera's body language especially is directly, directly related to her mood. From large sweeping strokes of her arms when she is feeling comp confident or rebellious, to curling up when her world crashes. All of this is captured from the wide. Little Vera is a perestroika era film being filmed in 1988. Uh, this era was set forth by the coming to power of Mikhail Gorbachev in 1985. So this is three years into the perestroika era. Um, and this in this era, Gorbachev uh, spoke very openly about economic stagnation and issues with uh, standards of living. And so in an effort to kickstart uh, a stagnating economy, he introduced market-like economic reforms. And uh, so this economic restructuring is what is known as perestroika. Uh, and although perestroika refers to more, refers to a more westernized economy, that westernization carries into culture and media during the time. And uh, with, this is evident in the movie, Little Vera. Um, this time period in the Soviet Union looked a lot like the same time period in the U.S. Uh, in the movie that was shown with uh, heavy emphasis on American style rock music, um, young adults uh, being depicted as not having a strong sense of direction or ambition in contrast to... Uh, Soviet films we've seen earlier. The media during this era experienced increased artistic freedom uh, as a result of a decrease in censorship. And uh, Little Vera was actually widely popular in part because uh, of its nudity, which hadn't been seen as much before. Our creative response to the film is in the form of an extension of the action to include a continuation of some of the allegorical themes from the film with the context of how the political system has progressed and changed since 1988, when the movie was originally released. We began where the film left off, with the collapse of Vera's father and the looming question of whether or not Sergei loved Vera. At the time of the release of the film, the Soviet Union was certainly in decline but its dissolution was not anticipated by the citizenry. From a modern vantage point, we chose to include the collapse of the Soviet system symbolized by the death of Vera's father. In the original ending, it is unclear what happens to him, likely because the fate of the Soviet Union and the Soviet legacy were unclear at the time. The response goes on to include several brief interactions amongst the characters who were affected by the father during his life representing the post-Soviet people as they cope with the loss. Various responses, including hopelessness, anger, apathy, and acceptance are shown by the characters after the father's death. The eventual resolution symbolizes the inclusion of the Soviet legacy in the Russian narrative as a small part surrounded by all of the other parts of the narrative, past, present, and future. In the response, 
Vera's life after the death of her father and her eventual happiness are representative of the future of Russia and the continual discourse surrounding the Soviet legacy. Are you going to answer me? Do you still love me or not? Something fell in the kitchen. Where are you going? Come back. What's going on? Where, what do you? Can you answer me? Can you say something? Can you say anything? <laughs> He's gone, bro. Get up. We need to do something. We have to get over everything. Get up. Somewhere, I suppose. Mama will come live with Sonia and I. Mishka will keep her busy. It'll be good for her. Let's go. What about us? Who do we have to provide for us? I mean, he was mean and a drunk. An attempted murderer. But he provided for us. He gave us food and a place to live and certainty about where we would spend the night. Yeah, it's up to you guys now. You know, you guys have to figure out what you're going to do. Build a life for yourselves. I do. What? I thought about it while we were apart. I couldn't have been so afraid of losing you if I didn't. I do still love you. And it doesn't matter what happens in the future, as long as we're together. Do you agree? Yeah. We'll find some place to live, and we'll make a life together. And forget about him. No, we can't forget about him. He provided for me my entire life. There's good memories with the bad. We can't just forget about him. So what do you suggest? Well, I mean, he's part of our story. He's part of our past, maybe not our future, but we have to remember him. We can't just ignore him. Maybe some big way or some small, but he's part of our story. Sure. 